Welcome to Adventures in Science, starring Adventure Man. Welcome to another exciting episode of Adventures in Science, with me, your host, Adventure Man. Today, we'll be looking at simple machines, but first, I have an exciting announcement. I'm happy to say that our show has been so successful that we were able to add two great new personalities to the Adventures in Science team. First, we have a director. Ms. Director, come on out and say hi to our viewers. Hello, everyone. Usually the director keeps behind the scenes, but we'll be taking a reality approach here on Adventures in Science. We like giving viewers a little glimpse behind the scenes, so you'll definitely be seeing me from time to time. Great. Glad to have you aboard. I'm sure it will make my life a lot easier. Thanks. I'm really excited about it. See you later. Great. We've also hired a special science consultant. Now don't get me wrong. I'm great at science. But sometimes we need someone to do research, give us a little more in-depth information. Well, now we have her. And here she is. May I introduce to you Susie Science. Hello. Welcome to the team. I'm really excited to work with you. Thank you very much. It's an honor. Wow, I have to tell you, I think it's just great that we found someone who's not only so highly qualified, but also someone with such an appropriate name. Susie Science, I mean, wow, that's great. Um, you do know that's not my real name. It's a stage name? Really? Uh, yeah? You know, like Adventure Man? Oh, yeah, sure, of course, I... I knew that. I was just, I was just kidding. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, now that we've done our introductions, let's get the show on the road, shall we? Like I said, today's episode is about simple machines, and since we now have our resident science expert with us, why don't I ask her, Susie? Can you tell us what simple machines are? A machine is something with one or more parts which is used to make work easier. And the word simple means not complicated or only having a few steps or parts. Right. So a simple machine is something with only one or two parts that people use to make work easier. So a train is a machine, but does it have only one or two parts? No, it has thousands of parts. It's a machine, but it's not a simple machine. Exactly. Can you think of something that's used to make work easier, but does have only one or two parts? Hmm, let's see. How about a hammer? Excellent example, Adventure Man. A hammer can be just one piece, but it makes the work of driving a nail a whole lot easier. Yeah, can you imagine trying to push a nail down into a piece of wood without using a hammer? I don't think it can be done. Why don't you demonstrate, Adventure Man? Great idea. See here? The amount of force needed to push this nail into the wood is just too much for me to do it with just my hand. I need something that will help me multiply my force, make it much bigger. Right. You need a lot more force to push that nail into the wood. And that's where a simple machine, like a hammer, comes in handy. A hammer is a simple machine called a lever. We'll talk about those again later. Sounds like a plan. Okay, cut. So let's have you do some review. Remind us what a simple machine is, and then let's have you tell us what the different kinds of simple machines are. Sound good? Great. So to review, a simple machine is something made of only a few parts and is used to make work easier. There are six different kinds of simple machines. Wheel and axle, screw, pulley, inclined plane, lever, and wedge. Today we'll be taking a look at each of these and what they do. Ready? Ready. All right. Cut. That was good, but 
I'd like to see a little more enthusiasm when you say all right. So let's do that again with just a little more energy this time, okay? Okay, no problem. Action! Ready! All right! Cut! Getting there! Susie, your delivery is just fantastic! Perfect! Seriously? Adventure Man, okay, okay, almost there! One more time, but really give it all you got, okay? Okay... Action! Ready! <laughs> Cut! Great! Now you got it! That's exactly what I was looking for! Sorry. You're just messing with me, aren't you? Who? Me? Why would I do a thing like that? I wonder... Moving right along... There are six different kinds of simple machines. Wheel and axle, screw, pulley, inclined plane, lever, and wedge. Now, it can be kind of hard to remember lists of things, so it always helps to have some kind of little trick to help with that. These little memory tricks are called mnemonic devices. And I have a good one to help us remember the six simple machines. Remember that the whole point of a simple machine is to make it easier to do some kind of work. You have to put in less of your own energy to get the same job done. So you could say that you have to put in less work. If we're using a simple machine, you could say that we'll simply put in less work. And that's your mnemonic device, isn't it? It sure is. If you take a look at that sentence, the first letter of each word is also the first letter of one of the simple machines. Wheel. Wheel and axle. Simply. Screw. Put. Pulley. In. Inclined plane. Less. Lever. Work. Wedge. Wheel. Simply. Put. In. Less. Work. Wheel and axle. Screw, pulley, inclined plane, lever, and wedge. Great job, Susie. Thank you. That's actually a great little mnemonic device there. It's much easier to remember a sentence than just a list. Cut. Nice job, guys. I think we should move on now to showing some examples of the different simple machines, okay? Okay. Let's look at the six simple machines. Wheel simply put in less work. First one, wheel and axle. The job of the wheel and axle is to beat friction. Friction is the force that stops things from moving when they rub together. Right. If we slide on the floor, we very quickly come to a stop. Why? Because our feet rub on the floor. And when two things rub together, there's friction. If there were no friction, we could go on sliding and sliding and sliding as long as we liked. Of course, stopping would be a problem. True. Whenever we're trying to get some kind of physical work done, too much friction can make it difficult to do. But we do need friction. Without it, we couldn't do much of anything. Without some friction, we couldn't even walk. Our feet would just keep sliding on the floor forever. It's the friction between our feet and the floor that allows us to push ourselves forward and walk. One foot is held in place by friction, and we can use that friction to push ourselves forward as we take a step. But there are many times when we need to reduce friction to get things done. And that, my friends, is where the wheel and axle come in. The job of the wheel and axle is to beat friction. What do I mean? Well, let's look at an example. It might sound like a crazy question, but why do cars and trucks have wheels? To beat friction, of course. Right. Here we see a truck on a ramp. A ramp is another name for the inclined plane, another simple machine. So why isn't the truck moving down the ramp? 
obviously, because it has no wheels. Gravity is pulling the truck down, but it isn't moving down the ramp because without wheels, there's too much friction. The bottom of the truck is rubbing on the surface of the ramp. Friction. But if we use the wheel and axle, we can easily beat that friction. Friction will still be trying to stop the movement, but the wheels will beat it and allow the truck to move. Yes, the wheel beats friction. And the axle is just the part that holds the wheel in place. It can connect two wheels together, or it can just be there in the middle to be the thing the wheel spins around. The wheels wouldn't help the truck very much if they weren't actually attached to the truck. So that's where the axle comes in. Let's attach the wheel and axle to the truck and demonstrate. You can see here how the axle holds the wheels on the truck. Let's try it out. Ready, go. There you have it. Wheel and axle beats friction. Cut. Adventure Man, I'd like to give the audience a really good idea of how this works. So I had the production team create a giant wheel, which I thought we could use to have you demonstrate how it can overcome friction. Hey, sounds like fun. Great idea. Let's do it. Where's this wheel? Here we go. We built it to be just the right size for you. Gee, thanks. All part of our friendly service. Just step on in there and hold on. Great. How's this? Perfect. Two hours later. Glad to say I'm fine. We'll simply put in less work. Next up is the screw. A screw is basically a ramp going around and around in a tight circle, often with a wedge at the tip. Exactly. Watch this demonstration. I have a piece of paper cut in the shape of a ramp. If we twist the pencil, the ramp gets wrapped up around and around. We've turned this ramp into a screw. A screw is just like a ramp wrapped around a central post. Here's a picture of a spiral staircase. It's in the shape of a screw, and obviously it makes it easier to go to the second story of the house. You could just drop a rope straight down and climb straight up to the second floor, but that would take a lot of energy because you're moving your body straight up against gravity. If you use a ramp, like a set of stairs, that would make it much easier because you're still going up, but at an angle. You're not going straight up against gravity. And that is the great thing about a ramp or an inclined plane. It can let you go from a lower place to a higher place while putting in a lot less work. But in science, you don't get anything for free. If you're having to put in less work, then you have to give something else up. There's always a trade-off. In this case, the trade-off is that you have to put in less work to go up, but you have to move a much longer distance to get there. So you could use a ramp, a staircase, to the second floor, but that takes up a lot of space. To save space, you could use a spiral staircase like this one. It's just a set of stairs that has been curled around a central post, like my pencil example. And then, of course, screws are also used to hold things together. A screw can hold things much more tightly than a nail. But, once again, there's a trade-off. You can very quickly get the nail in place by using a lot of force with a hammer. The screw takes more time, but once it's done, it will hold a lot better. Here's a perfect example. You see here in this large piece of wood that I have attached a nail and a screw. It's not easy, but if I use enough force, I can pull the nail right out. For something simple like hanging a picture, a nail would be fine. But if it's something that needs to be held tightly together, 
a screw would be best. Watch as I try to remove the screw. Can't do it! Cut! Nice. You explained that really well. Pulling out the nail? Thanks. I think we need something a little more dramatic, though. A more exciting demonstration. Something to thrill the audience. Okay, yeah, I, I see your point. What did you have in mind? Hmm, how about if you hang on the screw? Show that the nail comes right out, but the screw, that, can hold your entire body weight. Okay, how's this? Okay, better, but mm, not quite as dramatic as I thought it would be. I need some real excitement here. Um, you know, here's an idea. Let's do this over a cliff. Um... A, a cliff over the water? I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You, you get wet? I mean, you are Adventure Man, after all. Right you are. Let's do it. A little later. So here we are at a cliff over the ocean, where I'm going to demonstrate what an incredibly strong hold a screw has. I wouldn't dream of trusting my weight to the nail. It would definitely pull out, and I'd be in for a long, long fall into the ocean. But the screw, now that can hold me. Watch as I hang on this screw. And for the record, I did check the strength rating to make absolute sure the screw could hold my weight. Safety first. Um, did you also check the strength of the wood? Wait, what? Ah! Two hours later. I'm beginning to be a little suspicious of my new team. Okay, moving right along, we come to the pulley. A pulley is used to lift things or lower things. When you pull down, the object goes up. When your hand goes up, the object moves down. It changes the direction of the force. Usually a pulley has a wheel. Can you guess why? Well, we already learned what a wheel does. It beats friction. Here we see a pulley way up high in this big tree. If the cable were just thrown over the branch, it could still work. It would just be harder because the cable would rub against the branch and that friction would make it harder to move. A compound pulley is when you have more than one pulley attached. That will make the job even easier. But with just one pulley like this, it doesn't actually make it any easier to lift. It just changes the direction of the force. So, you basically just have to be strong enough to lift the object. Let's show you how this works. Hmm, we're going to need something to lift. Uh, let's see... Yeah, and who's going to do the lifting? Someone's going to have to pull the other end of the rope. Huh? Somebody have a horse? Pyaa! Well, that was an adventure. Anyway, uh, next up is the lever. A lever can give you power to move or lift things. You'll notice this lever looks kind of like a seesaw. That's because a seesaw is what's called a class 1 lever. Let's take a look at it and see how to use it to make work easier. This part is called the fulcrum, and where you put it has a lot to do with how much help the lever can give you. The way it works is, the object to be lifted goes on one end, the fulcrum goes somewhere in between, and the effort, the force, is used at the other end. Depending on where the fulcrum is determines how much easier the lever will make your job. Okay, let's use this huge rock as an example. It's too big for me to lift on my own. Let's see if we can lift it using the lever. Okay, Adventure Man. Uh, an example would be great. Once again, though, I, I think, you know, instead of a rock, we should go for something 
the audience can really connect with, something they'll be emotionally invested in. Okay. At this point, I am afraid to ask, though. Any ideas? Hmm. How about this? We'll try to lift you. That's great. I love it. Let's do it. Let's see if the ladies can lift me. All right. Cut. That was fun, but honestly, it wasn't quite as compelling as I thought it would be. Oh, boy. Here we go. I'm starting to have a bad feeling about this. What can we do? What can we do? Hmm. Ah, I have an idea. Stand on the lever again, Adventure Man, okay? Oh. Okay. Later. Thankfully, I landed in the water again. Let's move on to the last one, the wedge. Susie, why don't you tell us about it? Sure. Something interesting that a wedge does is to change the direction of the force. You push in one direction with the wedge, and it takes that force and pushes outwards instead. For example, an axe. When you swing the axe downward, it hits the wood and changes that downward force into a sideways force and pushes the pieces apart. And to give you much more power to do it with, the axe is also a lever. It's called a third class lever, meaning the fulcrum is at the end where you hold it. That gives the person swinging the axe much more power. Oh, you know what? I have a great idea of how to end the show with something really cool, very dramatic. I'm starting to suspect your motives, but okay. Who? Oh, me? Seriously? Would you like to hear my idea? I'm probably going to regret this, but okay. Well, someone's building a log cabin in the area, and he needs to chop down a tree for it. He's going to do it in the background, so we can get to see the axe in action. There. See? You don't even need to get anywhere near the action. Perfectly safe. Okay, let's do it. Soon after. So, our lumberjack friend in the background there is using an axe to cut down that big tree. It still takes a lot of energy to do it, but since the axe is a wedge and a lever, it makes it a lot easier. Timber! Much later. And there you have it. Simple machines. I'm glad there are only six. I don't think I could survive anymore. <sighs> and that concludes today's exciting episode of Adventures in Science. With me, your host, Adventure Man. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>